Sorry, should I repeat this? One? Yes. <laughs> it's it's at six thirty at twenty one seconds on October twenty three, and we're going to call this meeting to order. Uh, Deputy Clerk, can you please do the roll call? Ellis, Francie, here. Aiken, here. Hodgkin, here. Lawrence, here. Mackey, here. Morrison, here. Tercini. She is on. She's online. It just hasn't unmuted her yet. Prado, Theodore, here. Swore, here. Taylor, here. Orr, here. Thank you. Can we please rise if you can for the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are you approved tonight's agenda? Yes, we've been seconded. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes? Okay, we're going to be public comments. Uh, please limit your comments to three minutes. Be respectful. And uh, please start with your name and your address or ward number. And the first thing that has to be the red bus and it'll turn on the memory. You can lower that down. Just, just pull it down. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Lynette Taylor, and I'm only 411. So that's why I have to have it down so low. Um, I believe I'm in World 2. Um, please ask the letter of me. <laughs> um, I just have a couple of things. I had talked to Liz about it, but the park, um, Justin McBadden is well the baby manager there. And he has been hassling several of us residents, me included. And um, Liz said, I said, you need to call Ellen and I or that, but he is having his 12 year old daughter work in the park and it's being paid for it. And how I know that is that I pick up children at Miller. I pick them up at every school. It's a service I provide. And um, she came up and told me that she had earned $150. And I said, oh, and she said, yeah, my dad's having me clean and paint the trailers at the park. And um, that kind of bothered me because they fired everybody else. Um, they did let the sex offender go, which was good, I guess. Now he's out wandering around. Um, but now we have nobody, um, except for Vince, and he's not a very good person at all. And um, we're still having some problems with people dumping the garbage over on the dike side. And just to let you know that, um, part of the problem is manager. Uh, his wife and his mother were out there and they cleaned up part of behind the trailer and they had taken a shopping cart full of stuff and pushed that and pushed it down and there's all kinds of garbage down there on the other side of the dike now. So I don't know exactly who they tell about that because no one seems to come out and look. Um, so, and we did put the blocks up on the one side, but um, over by the apartment, there's a road that comes up and around. And if they could put the blocks over that way, it would stop the traffic from 38, which is down there where Justin lives. And a lot of his friends are bringing their stuff and jumping over there. And that would help that at least Stop the rats and the stuff, and we do have um, a, um, I don't think you call them a bird, a coyote. Um, there's about five of them that um, are now 
in the park because it's all garbage. Which bothered me because, you know, I mean, it's bad enough to be having raccoons, which don't bother me, but kites are a little bit bigger. And one isn't too bad, but when there's, oh, they're called a pack, that's why. Um, anyways, that would be it. And thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, um, I actually wrote a public comment. Um, I submitted the right name and I had a whole. Oh, I love Jane Nelson with Lakeside Industries. Um, I had a whole written out comment to provide, but I think I'm going to go off the cuff here. Um, so I'm with Lakeside Industries. Our um, property within the zoning code is going to be rezoned to the waterfront zone. And I had previously requested that you um, make a very small change to the planning or to the zoning code to allow asphalt in that zone. Um, before this meeting today, I was speaking with Director Scott, and she actually um, suggested that the better approach that um, hopefully the city would be willing to do is to simply rezone Lakeside in the industrial zone. And um, the reason that we were class with is that um, Lakeside is very interested in making environmental um, improvements to our operations whenever possible. Um, we invest heavily in our communities, we invest in our um, asphalt plants, and um, when we are not zoned consistently with our operations, it makes it really difficult to make those advancements to improve our environmental footprint and make, um, make things better at our site. So I'm hoping that you will support having Lakeside's property rezoned. Uh, it's consistent with other properties in that area. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, uh, so I know that this is uh, quite odd, you know, for me to do this sort of thing, but. Uh, if you'll just start with your name and ward. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, my name is Matthew Wells, I'm in Ward 3. And uh, so, yeah, so uh, this is the first. Uh, so I'm making a public comment. It's also my last. I have worked for the Daily World for just about three years, and I really enjoyed working for the residents of Aberdeen, Hoquiam, and the rest of Grace Harbor. I haven't always made people happy, like some in this room, but I tried my best to, to do what was right. Okay. <clears throat> Whether that was defending someone who was wrong or uh, standing up for, you know, uh, the small guys that uh, uh, person said, I uh, did what I thought was right. I uh, don't claim to be the best city council reporter, but it's not where I shine. Everyone has strengths and weaknesses, but still, I. I have my best. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is I have just about one week left working for the news uh, paper, and uh, that will be a wrap for me. I stand here because I've uh, built a home here. I've immersed myself in the community and race hover culture. It's the longest I've worked for any newspaper, and I really care about this area. And that uh, carrier goes way beyond the paper itself. So that brings me to one more point. This area has a lot of good in it. There's no reason to uh, constantly there's no reason to uh, constantly tear it down for its flaws. Sure, you know, its flaws just like everywhere else in the U.S. Um, but anyway, if it was as bad as some folks say it is, then I would not have stayed here. I have left, and I think a lot of people around this area would have left a long time ago as well. 
millimeter this record. That's horrible on the spot. So please in the future realize what you have here in uh, uh, Grace Harbor. Try to improve it. Try to be uh, proud of it. Uh, I know I am. So that's all I have. It's time. Thank you. My name is Janice Duffy. I'm one of the librarians at the Aberdeen Timberland Library. I just wanted to remind everyone that we have a myriad of programs for all ages. We have playgroup every Thursday from 10 to 11, as well as family story time from 1030 to 1130 every Friday. Also starting uh, November 7th on Fridays from 430 to 530, I have started a Cards program for seniors. So we have Euchre and Bridge and Pinochle. Uh, we can play any card games that we want, Rummy, what have you. And that starts uh, November 10th. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Uh, and we'll move on to the consent agenda with Council President Swart. On motion to approve tonight's consent agenda, which includes minutes from the October 9th meeting, accounts payable and payable. Okay. I've looked at second. Is there any discussion? Yeah. In that, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, so tonight we have uh, two presentations. The first mm -hmm. one is going to be Grace Harper, uh, yeah, Grace Harper Special Operations Response Team with Chief Colby. Uh, thank you. I figured you'd up here so I'm back in the hole and you can actually push the buttons. Push the mic down. Can you push the mic down? Just there you go. So uh, I am given the opportunity to be able to come to the council this evening and discuss with you uh, just kind of a heads up informational presentation for you uh, on uh, something we've got working on locally, uh, calling it the Grace Harbor Special Operations uh, Rescue Team. Uh, so to give you some insight on what, what this looks like and moving forward. So next slide. It doesn't want to expand, Maybe. so we're going with this. Box sticky. I moved on. <laughs> okay, well, I'll just talk through it and it's frozen. It so you, you got that. So uh, what is the special operations rescue team? Uh, this is more uh, easily said to as a technical rescue team concept that has been lacking regionally for uh, for quite some time. Uh, when you talk about these special operations, they need to think of rope rescue, water rescue, confined space rescue, things of that nature. These specialized disciplines um, that were very frequently were called to to assist in. Uh, fire department operations that uh, today it were mandated for that fire response. Uh, that's the bare minimum that they were mandated to do through state law. Uh, EMS is also part of that, that we, we tackle that as well. Uh, where there's a kind of referred to as a black hole in our service delivery is these technical rescue operations that we are not equipped or trained truly to do. Well, it's going on its own speed. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll try to keep up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and these uh, technical rescue disciplines are much more complex instances that uh, we have specialized training and equipment is needed. Um, how we view it at this point is that uh, at a basic level, all of our firefighters uh, in the county, uh, in Aberdeen for sure, is trained to the what we call an awareness level. So we're trained to be able to identify the need special operations rescue technical rescue situation that exists when we arrive on scene we stabilize the incident and we call for help the closest rescue team for us in grace Harbor actually is in thurston county so we're having to call them into the end of the county to help assist with this rescue discipline uh, and that can range anywhere depending on where you're on the county but in our response area here in Aberdeen, we're probably talking close to 90 minutes by the time the team assembled and response from Virginia County. So there's quite a delay 
there for that response to come in. Uh, why do we need a uh, special uh, operations uh, response team? And it's, you know, these types of emergencies are already happening locally that we're called upon and kind of being put into a position of having to act without the proper equipment and training. Uh, this was something that was clearly identified through our uh, feasibility study of the Aberdeen and Hopewim Fire Departments. So uh, when we were talking about the RFA, well, even before the RFA came up, but in our consolidation talks um, as a, again, a black hole in our, our service delivery. Uh, again, we're showing up, we're identifying this, and our nature is to not stand back and just wait. We're going to get in there and, and do things, which does create some liability. Um, if Ellen and I get some involved with that, then we're not going to be fine. And those findings can escalate very quickly because of the with willful, uh, uh, just draw a blank of the word I want, not misconduct, but the willful breaking of those laws because we know we're not supposed to do this, but we're doing it anyway. So those findings will multiply. And then if there's an injury because of it, that just compounds costs as well. Uh, it's time lost, but uh, medical care and the like. Um, and it's, it's a public expectation. Uh, people think we do that, but we, we don't. So it's, it's something the public expects us to do as well. And again, just as the safety or our, our responders as well. Doing this is um, much more than just one department and it's such a heavy lift, especially for a department of our size. So we approached this uh, through the Grace Harbor Fire Chiefs group uh, from a regional basis. So it's going to be at this time ourselves with Aberdeen, Oakland Fire, Montesano Fire, East Grace Harbor Fire, and the Sheriff's Department are partnering together to start this team up locally. Uh, the way we're starting it is we're going to be under the umbrella of Thurston County's team. They've agreed to the us on and let us grow underneath them. Um, and the, the end goal of this, and it's going to take a few years to get there, but the end goal is for us to become our own team and stand alone and not rely on the Thurston County component to be able to do this ourselves regionally. So uh, the training we're <laughs> Training we're starting with is um, the rope rescue training. Uh, that class was actually held last week up in uh, Mud Bay at McLean Fire Station up there. Uh, we sent a handful of our people along with the rest of the team members. Um, and this is the foundation of all of these rescue disciplines. So we'll be building off of this through our training programs in the next couple of years. Um, the uh, cost of this going into it, just to give you an idea, these are things that I've been budgeting for. Um, we got our initial setup, which includes equipment for the, the responders themselves, the personal equipment in the neighborhood of about three eight hundred dollars per person, and then um, also uh, some training costs will come into that as well. Some specialized classes. There will be an annual, I'm calling it a membership fee, if you will, into the Thurston County sort, uh, which all of their agencies pay in as well. And we're looking at a $3,500 per year um, to, be, to be part of this conglomerate team in Thurston County. Um, and with that, we get uh, you know free response from them. They won't charge us for any response if they have that ability to do that now. Um, they will help us use some hazard identification to make sure that we've got these certain target hazards in our area that are going to be sus uh, potential use of this uh, skill set. Um, ongoing training will be part of this and just also supplying equipment through this to help support the team and it's, that's in equipment as well. Um, some of the reasons why we're doing this, um, one of the big ones is retention and recruitment. Um, this is one of those things, oh, you've got a special rescue team. That sounds cool. I want to you know, join your department and it could be a, you know, a, a recruitment tool as well as a um, retention tool. Uh, this is the safety for our firefighters. We want to learn how to do this properly and safely within the, the rules of, of each discipline. Uh, the quicker response times, again, like I said, we're waiting sometimes up to 90 minutes for Thurston County to arrive if we need to do this. 
Uh, so we'll be able to mitigate these things much quicker, get to those patients, get patients out of the area they're in uh, to be able to give them the care they need. Um, less than the liability, and to me, that's one of the bigger ones. We're, we're now going to be falling in line with those LNI standards. And number two is just to help speak those expectations that the citizens already have on us. They, they don't know that we don't do this. Um, so we're going to meet those expectations. So what's next? Uh, just so you know, we're, we started this process. Um, we are looking at grant funding to help us with these initial costs of the equipment. That, and that as we go to uh, different avenues to, to be able to help fund this, so it's not going to fall on each, each city department to be able to have to do this. Uh, we'll, you'll be seeing some MOUs coming out in the near future uh, between city and uh, Thurston County sort team to uh, be able to umbrella us up underneath them. And just request for funding, we may see down but in the future. We may want to maybe create, you know, maybe a budget uh, line item for rescue equipment. Um, and that's going to be dependent on just it, how grant funding goes, um, the funding into the sort team from Thurston County, and just city to city how that looks like. So that's uh, just a brief overview of what that looks like, what to expect uh, from us, and if there's any questions. Council Member Oh, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you, Chief. I appreciate it. Very interesting. Um, I assume that in addition to LNI exposure, that they may fine you if you're doing something you're not supposed to be because you're not adequately trained. What about liability of from rescuees that if you don't do something right and you hurt them that, that, or something, is yeah. there also a liability for that? There, there is that there too. If we're doing something wrong and injurious, Furthermore, you know, a patient that we're trying to rescue that needs that opens that door as well. Are you also going to be working with the Coast Guard on this? Not initially. We may at some point uh, when we get more into the water rescue, that's going to be a little farther down. Uh, we kind of have a building block program. Again, we start with ropes. Okay. We're going to get into some structural collapse. And water rescue is kind of farther down. Yeah. Water rescue is a very unique thing. They, that lives by law with the sheriff's department. Okay. Believe it or not. So we'll be interfacing more with them. Okay. And they'll be kind of the driving force that we'll be involved. Yeah, because we have a lot of water around here. Yeah. <laughs> um, is, there some, is there some kind of like certification that the department or the individual firefighters get for this? Yes. Yeah, so for the firefighters themselves, it's not the department wise. Uh, that we're going to get as an agency, but each firefighter that goes through the training will get, there's different levels. I talked about awareness initially. There's an awareness level training, there's an operations level training, and there's a technician, which is the high. Uh, so eventually, we're going to get in these disciplines. The goal is to you know, up to technician level in all these different disciplines. But it's a building block to get there. The class we just did uh, through Grace Harbor, I believe it was 16 people went up and now have an operations level. So the number two level for ropes. Wow. So their next step will be the tech, and they'll be able to do all of the technical rescue of ropes once they get back. So Appreciate it. One last question. Sure. Um, so you have not included any uh, request or funds for this for a component of it in the 2025 budget then? Yes. You have? Yes, I, I've got some equipment uh, dollars in my budget for 25, as well as the uh, the $35 fee for the team itself to efficient down. Thank you, Chief. Yeah. You actually answered mine. So. Okay. Mine is not so much a question as a thank you. Um, I have personal experience with this. When I was a young kid, I was chasing my siblings around the babysitter's house and fell into the well. And I was stuck in there for at least an hour or two. And it's like something I can barely remember. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yes. Yeah, no, there's definitely a need. Uh, up and when we have not had many incidents within the city of Aberdeen, but you know, as I like to say, my business is not dip, it's when. Um, but throughout the county, there's been a number of them, even since we started this, and we're like, oh, there's one, there's one, there's one. So, yeah, we can hopefully mitigate those much, much quicker. Don't you would like to be All right, thank you. Thank you, Chief. All right, our, our next presentation is the vacant building update by John.
Let's see if I could do a better job with yours. Sure, right. Community Mayor, City Council. My name is Josh Patton, I'm the building official for the city of Aberdeen. It's like a second time's a charm. So this is a recap. We started this program roughly a year ago today. This is my team, myself, Wendy Dancer, and DJ Coxon, the code enforcement officer. So uh, without them, you know, I wouldn't be able to do this because they aid me in kind of communicating with the property owners and also educating them on why uh, we do this and what the city's kind of trying to get done and what we're striving for. So the program is designed to assist in preserving the buildings. The whole point of this is if the, the buildings deteriorate to a point where they can't be used, you know, people who have a vision, it's it's never gonna happen. So that's kind of what we're we're trying to do is save these buildings so that somebody can maybe make something out of them. So when we started this, we drove around, we discovered that there was 41 vacant commercial spaces. We actually changed that to one of them just registered. So it's actually 19 registered and we have 19 that are in progress as well. So um, is this in the whole thing or? This is just the downtown Aberdeen district. And so we've got, uh, let's see, September 2023, we started sending out notices to the property owners. We had uh, 41 vacant, 13 now have active businesses. 10 are actively making repairs or steps towards demolishing. Um, three are non-compliant. Eight I have communicated with regarding the plans, which no permits are in place right now, so it's just a communication. Um, and then six have not provided any future plans, which as you can see on this slide, it's a little more colorful. So all the ones that are highlighted in green are actually registered with the vacant building program. The three red ones are non-compliance, and then all the ones that are not highlighted in the color um, either are actively repairing or remodeling or have complied and have an active business. These next few slides will kind of show a before and after of some of our, I, I call them the success stories. This one probably be one of the biggest ones because this one's actually got 18 newly remodeled apartments in it. So we're actually getting ready to get them their certificate, certificate of occupancy so they can start letting these out. This next one, I know everybody's got their eyes on this one. So they actually have an active demo permit and are in the process of working on creating this, which this is uh, what their new design is going to be. And our goal, obviously, for the city is to create a place where people want to stop and walk around the streets, visit the shops, um, give people a reason to get together. Um, I said pretty much to do this, we need to bring in new business with new businesses. We hope to create more community events and potentially with these new businesses, they'll help grow the existing community events that we already have. Before we get to the questions, um, I know there's a few things that with it being a year, I would like to potentially change, um, which I know with the, the monthly uh, inspections, that really hasn't been working. So we've been talking in the office about eliminating the inspection fees for we can legally send a notice stating that we're going to do the inspection on a certain day and then I can still get it. Um, and then we potentially up the registration fees. And then another item that I'd like to bring up is some of these parcels for the commercial spaces actually have leasing spaces in them. And right now with the way the codes are written, as long as there's one occupant in that space, you know, now we have other spaces that are sitting vacant, so I didn't know if we wanted to eventually address that for these extra leasing spaces. Oh, God. Josh, can I add one thing to that? Yes. 
I just want to ask one thing too. So in discussion or questions, our legal counsel is online tonight. We asked them specifically to attend for this part of it. So if there are any questions about certain legalities to this program, that they are available as well. Just wanted to follow up on that slide you showed of the motel that's the budget bird. Budget. Yeah, being converted. What what's that going to become? Or it's not converted. So they're not converting it. They're going to what the existing office is right now. Their future plans are to make that into a restaurant, and then they're going to demo a section, which it shows right here, and make that parking. And they're actually going to remodel the remaining units and then they're going to build a new portion for the new office. Oh, so it'll be a, a motel yeah. with the restaurant. So and just so you guys are aware, all those before and after pictures that you saw earlier are the same people that are doing this. Oh, wow. Um... <laughs> I, uh, I like San Francisco's abandoned building policies that they have in place and their program goes by linear footage and we were just about to be spaces, but they go by the uh, linear footage of storefront. That's how they didn't really care about the rest of the building, what is going on in the rest of the upstairs. They, I guess every six months they double their, their fine. So it's it's kind of a hard program, but it's working pretty well. <laughs> That's what I was. Deb and I actually just spoke about this before the meeting started, about you know how to motivate people who own property here for a long time and just they're not maintaining it. It's sitting empty and and it does you know cause problems, attracts you know people to break in and their copper, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I liked, you know, what Doug shared, you know, that um, in San Francisco, I was thinking with New York as well, that, you know, they have six months when the building cannot be occupied and then they start getting fines after that. And I, you know, we need to motivate people to um, do something rather than just, you know, use it as a write off and the building kind of crumbles and it does affect the town negatively. Yeah. Do you, yeah, want, I can hear this talk. you want me to? Yeah, we can't find. So. We are not, so in Washington State in particular, and hopefully Hillary will jump in and correct either Josh or I if we're 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 taking this in the wrong path. But um, this program is about all that we can do. We are not legally allowed to find people for ugly or vacant buildings. We can hold them accountable to the building code standards, but we are not able to find them. Oh, no. So how do you hold them accountable? This program. And and so what's the consequence of not following the you know, Basically, if they don't follow the, the AMC code, the vacant buildings program, the next step would be we can either move towards the abatement program and or get code enforcement involved. Okay. Well, something's happening. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, it's just Washington State passed stricter rules for um, privately owned buildings and what we can and cannot find people for and having a vacant building isn't one of those we are allowed to. Other states certainly do, we just aren't able to. Yeah. Interesting, California is stricter than we and are not as strict as we are. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I understand that the Becker building is getting some cleaning done. Will that extend to the upper stories um, for, for people coming into Aberdeen from across the bridge, that view of. So I've met with um, their local guy, I'm not gonna leave his name, and uh, they're starting with the bottom. They actually just got the right way through it the other day so that they can close off the sidewalk. They're gonna start with the bottom and work their way up, yes. Thank you. It makes some more sense to work your way down. Yeah, yeah all the <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mayor. Uh, um, I would like to really commend um, Director Scott and Josh for their work on this program. This program has been in existence for a year, and if you go back to the current vacant property slide, you'll see how many building property owners we were able to get to enroll. 
Um, it is slow moving, but there we've already received a lot of feedback that downtown is improving. Um, and most of all, we've been able to build a really strong relationship with Emirate International, who owns quite a few of the properties that are listed here, and to work with them. And, and I really commend Josh and his team. They work with them. They're, they build, have built really strong relationships with them in order to gain compliance, in order to get them to, do, to motivate them to move in the direction of repairing their buildings and getting them back to a place where we can get some more businesses located downtown. So um, I thank Lisa and Josh for their work on this. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for you, Is Emmerich under new man management? New management. Okay, do they have a new like liaison? <laughs> yes, they have a couple of new liaisons. That might sense. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, all right. Uh, mayor's reports. I have a long list here, but I'll keep it. Uh, first off, I wanted to thank Matthew before he leaves. I think uh, he's done an incredible job of, of unbiased, um, honest reporting. And I like. I like to see that. I hope that. If he leaves, that the paper can continue that uh, not sensationalizing things like that. So I appreciate your your work. With it. Uh, okay, then I'm just going to list a bunch of stuff. I just, some people think I don't do anything, but I I, I do a few things. But uh, firstly, uh, uh, my been meeting. Uh, I met with a couple of counselors last week. Uh, I've met with the downtown association, the design and economic vitality. Uh, and that was really good. They, they're, they got a lot of like great ideas for downtown. Met with the downtown association, um, our promotion committee. I've been on a few budget meetings since the last two weeks. Uh, and then a meeting I organized the Called it out the greens, and that's why it'd be a little controversial. But I want to help create a, a space downtown for uh, but, um, a community gathering space. And so uh, we've had two meetings with that, and it seems to be the one really well. Uh, I met with the Harbor Art Guild uh, Monday and requested that they uh, use some of their Rainbow Festival money to sponsor uh, a holiday, a list of holiday events downtown. And they have agreed to do that. And the list are, I don't, I'll just go through them all quickly. November 30th, um, we want to do a tree lighting ceremony at Zalasco Park. So, so the tree will be up um, in advance of that. And I'm hoping the lights won't really be turned on, but uh, we're offering the community to come down and bring an ornament that day and have some hot, hot chocolate and help us decorate the tree. And mm -hmm. yeah, so I, last year we did it and it stormed, and but still about 15 people came down and it was really a fun event. Um, then on the seventh, we have two events planned. Uh, one will be the start of the downtown holiday window display contest, and we're offering $200 prizes for that. Uh, also, that it will be the second time for us to do s'mores on, on K Street. So we offer free s'mores to anybody who comes down and wants to roast them. We provide all the materials. And we're our partner in that is the Music Project downtown in that, at the side one building. The Hershey Company in order to provide free chunks of water. We'll be contacting the Hershey County to see it over. They might, no, yeah. And then December uh, 14th, that's the next Saturday after that, we'll have the, uh, the second um, holiday dog parade downtown. And uh, we have Paws uh, in, uh, with us this year, and they're going to also be working with Mount Olympus to see if we can have some raise money for dogs that day. Then the next weekend, uh, December 21st, the, the holiday bike parade. Um, we're offering a hundred dollar uh, prize for the best bicycle. Oh, for the dog, we have a hundred dollar best dog and hundred dollars for best dog and and the owner, Carmo. So the Vox is uh, in Oakland is 
going to do the bike parade with us. So we're excited about that. Um, also, on the 21st, uh, we've met with some of the um, people who have floats in the Montesano Light Parade, and we're going to try and have those uh, some of those floats parked in Aberdeen on Broadway um, that night, so people can come down and look at them. It won't be a parade. Uh, and that's it for the the holiday thing. But we really, um, we really, as a group, feel that um, anything we can do to get people to to go downtown and break with our downtown is going to help our economy and help everybody. So, um, uh, okay. And then the final thing I wanted to talk about was I spoke with a young lady who does murals in town and uh, she's excited to start a program uh, with uh, Aberdeen High School uh, for art students who might be interested in helping to create murals in Aberdeen. And uh, we've identified some walls up in the neighborhoods and some staircases that. Um, will look good painted. So um, I'm going to be working with her and I'll report more on that as, as um, she gets more involved in it. That's my report. Um, let's see. So now we have council reports. Do we have any counselors that would like to? Uh, Joshua, thanks. Hi, uh, the part of my museum collection today. And also there was that one at the Downtown Aberdeen Association Rounding Table. Uh, there was a bunch of talk about sidewalk power shoulder. Um, it's, it's kind of getting me to think of getting a tool library in town. Like so something you could check out the power washer, the pressure washer, things about sidewalks. I thought we had that. The city's done it before. The city's, the city's always cleaned them. Yeah. The city's always cleaned the sidewalks, but yeah, we did be nice if the business owners could clean their own sidewalks and I, if I we could provide the tools. We, we had made a power washer available and they were clean alleys downtown. We have a special monster about a tool library, but then. Yeah, there's my yeah. understanding. Yeah. And we've had this discussion from both. Do you mean the No, that was from Yeah. My recollection was that was. Like hand tools, pick up the sticks, and be more simple. So, um, yeah, the city does, yes. You have to have, you have to have water, you have to have water. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Hmm. I'm sure they would be. But with I know the downtown associations are really interested in having a power washer also or, or a tool barn so that downtown businesses can clean their sidewalks and do stuff that they kind of rely on us to do, but they should be doing themselves. Yeah, so they should definitely have more thoughts about this stuff. Anybody else? Yeah, Councilor Seedorn. Got a few things. Um, Thanks to Director Sanger, we have some decibel readers that Council Member Lawrence has that uh, we can use to monitor the railroad traffic, the, the horns as they blow as they go through town. Um, it's interesting that the, the common comments that people will make is, geez, I wasn't aware of that until somebody mentioned it, and now I hear it all the time. And lately, in this last week, I have really, really picked up on those train horns, especially from about 9.35 at night until well after midnight, um, and including the couple mornings ago, like 4 or 4.30 in the morning. And they seem to be not only particularly loud, but particularly long. So it's going to be interesting. I might want to get one of those decibel readers and set up camp down that way sometime. Um, I also wanted to mention the Finance Committee. I appreciate their efforts. Uh, they met yesterday for a couple of hours um, with some of the directors. Uh, Tara Mumford was on call on Zoom and Director or um, City Administrator Clemens was there. And we poured through the city proposed budget for 2025 and had lots of questions and got lots of good answers. and. Just appreciated everybody's time, those who showed up and uh, went through it. And uh, I think that's about it. Thank you. Any other counselors? No. All right. So we'll go on to staff reports with uh, Administrator Clements. Um, staff at work 
really hard to put together the final touches of the budget. So we'll be talking more about that tonight, but that's been the center of my focus. Thank you. And many of the directors like to thank uh, Director Scott. Thank you. Tonight you have the second reading and public hearing on the zoning code. And I appreciate the comments that uh, Ms. Danielson had from Lakeside. And I think by um, we have on to approve the, the zoning code as well as the zoning map. And I think a simple change to the zoning map, making that industrial is what it should be anyway, um, is probably the easiest course for that. And we can have that revision ready to you by the third meeting. So, thank well, you. Thank you. Directors. Okay. If we want to do the budget. All right. Uh, so now we're going to go to a uh, request for council action uh, for finance. Chair Cedar. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we actually have four ordinances uh, first reading tonight. Uh, the first one is the first reading mm -hmm. of Bill 2408. An ordinance amending sections of AMC 3.76 to increase the tax on cable television services by one and a half percent and utility tax by five percent effective January 1st, 2025. I move that we approve this first reading of this ordinance. Second. Been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? A council person seat on. Um I know tax increases are not a fun thing. They're not something everybody jumps up and down for joy for. Um, we have considered some other ones earlier this year, like the EMS tax did not get approved. Um, and I know some other council members have suggested that maybe we consider and look at um, the 5% utility tax rate increase, maybe doing that over a couple of years of maybe two and a half or three percent the first year, a couple of percent or two and a half percent the second year. And while I was initially open to the idea and thinking about it, um, realized uh, the input that was provided from our finance staff and the city administrator was um, the, the tax is actually going to bring in close to a million dollars to the city. And that will go so far in dealing with the deficit that we've been dealing with. And again, it seems like every time we have been trying to consider moving forward with any kind of a tax increase, it always gets kicked down the road. We just can't keep kicking things down the road. Those costs every year just keep going up. And um, uh, as we get into the budget and deal with that more, I think you're going to see that it may be painful for some citizens. Maybe we can work out a program where if they're low income or other means tested, we could help them in some way. But otherwise, um, it's just a fact of life. We're just going to have to bite the bullet and deal with it. So thank you. Council person Gaten. You might be able to understand. Uh, so when it says you might you term thank you. So when it says five percent. That means 5% from water, 5% from PAD, 5% from garbage. Does each different utility draw the 5%? No, it would just be water and sewer and stormwater. PUD and garbage. natural gas are set at 6% by state law. Um, and then garbage is set by Lemay, I believe, but I could be wrong. So six percent. It's set at six percent. The five percent is just the water, water sewer, and it's normal. And that's a five percent increase. increase. The current rate is four and a half percent. So we're going to increase it to nine and a half percent. So it is technically actually it's just over doubling. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be on you know, the you know, I don't like tax increases, but it's the nature of the way the world is right now. People cannot absorb them. They just can't. So I'm going to vote no. Um, and I know that this is going to go through. Um, and I know the reasoning why. Um, but I do hope that speaking to Stan's point, that we can look into some kind of program to mitigate the cost for those that are really low income and, and just can't absorb this. Okay. 
That's what's I'm also concerned, you know, because um, people's Social Security has not gone up, but then I don't know when to get this 12% thing, because I think everything's 100% more expensive right now <laughs> than it used to be. Um, so I am really concerned for elderly people, especially they are they get very cold. And um, so that concerns me, but it's not their electricity, it's just water but and sewer, and that is depending upon how much water you use, right? Okay, so I don't know. I am concerned. I would really like to discuss this with CAP and some of our other organizations to see if they can help out those who just, I know they do an elect, a, you know, a program where you can get help with your electric bill. So I would really like to make an effort to help because there are a lot of low income people. That here that yeah, yeah, yeah. I would like to see that happen for sure. Is there any way that you could do it so that the 5% starts with new customers and we could hear the existing customers? Uh, no. Probably wouldn't make much of an yeah. impact, I would imagine, on how many new customers we get on an average monthly basis. Or something. Right. Mm -hmm. no. yeah, I think that I think that would also, from like an accounting perspective, that would be tough to track, um, as opposed to just providing a blanket. I think we also provided in the last time that Tara had presented for your base fees for um, water, sewer, and stormwater. It was about for base fees. It was about. It's a six dollar yeah six dollars yeah. yeah so that so doubling the percentage that can double that amount okay. no, no, that, 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 that is that is the that is the increase six dollars it's six dollar more for the yeah. base fees that's not it doesn't include a consumption like to a water consumption okay. oh, Miguel all in favor aye opposed no oh. that's great Ellis? Yes. Francie? Yes. Gakin? Hodgkin? Yes. Lawrence? Yes. Mackey? Yes. Morrison? No. Fercini? Debbie, are you online? Can you hear us? Let's see if we can. Zero. She's up there. Fredo? They're both on there. They're both just muted. Cedor? Yes. Four? Yes. Taylor? No. That's six to four, Mr. Mayor. That passes. Hey, um, for the second one, we have the first reading of Bill 24-09, an ordinance adopting a supplemental budget to change the 2024 appropriations and expenditures as specified. I move that we adopt this first reading of this bill. Second. Is there any discussion? In that, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Okay. Next, we have the first reading of Bill 24-10, an ordinance providing for the 2025 levy upon all taxable property within the city of Aberdeen. I move we adopt this first reading of this bill. Second. Is there any discussion? Either? Uh, you know, I know a lot of citizens will probably say, gosh, my property taxes are just so darn high, I can't afford to keep paying higher property taxes and everything. Uh, first off, this is the maximum that we can raise it, which is only 1%. And at most, this is going to bring in, I understand, about $30,000 to the city. $30,000. So that's, you know, in terms of... ...increasing property taxes by some huge astronomical sum. That's a mere drop in the bucket in terms of our overall budget. So just FYI. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Propose? No. Passes. And last week, lastly, but certainly not least, we have the first reading of Bill 24-11, an ordinance adopting the preliminary 2025 budget. I move that we adopt this first reading of this ordinance. Second. Is there any discussion? Councilor Wooderson, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so for the 2025 budget, 
Um, overall, there has been a tremendous amount of work that the city administrator and the staff and our um, accounting consultant, Kyra Mumford, have put into this. Um, they have really taken a lot of direction and lead from the city council in terms of uh, from our strategic planning meetings and workshops, talking about our priorities and our vision and goals for the city, but also uh, the, from the mayor in terms of trying to achieve a balanced budget, in particular for the general fund. The general fund is really the key element. And the general fund constitutes about $20 million out of our just over 100, about $103 million total city budget. Uh, general fund also covers most of the main things in the city, police and fire, uh, community development, parks and rec, um, and all that. So, uh, and, and a lot of those monies in the budget are for salaries and benefits. So it's really challenging to try to find ways to cut. Um, I think they've done a really good job. I know we strive for and our goal was to get a balanced budget. Uh, budget isn't quite balanced. It's still reflecting a $1.1 million approximate deficit for 2025, but those are due to some two, in particular, two one-time expenses, one of them being about 900000 approximately 866000 somewhere in there, for our um, asset recovery reserve fund which covers uh, replacing vehicles and major equipment in the city, which we have received some audit exceptions on in the past and have been criticized by the state auditor's office of not having a uh, replacement plan in place. We now have a replacement plan, uh, public works and, uh, major, and the police and fire, which have most of the major vehicles um, in the city have come up with some really good a detailed inventory and life plan for the vehicles and the equipment and what its replacement cost will be. And we've determined that we need to start setting aside almost a million dollars a year to, to uh, cover this. Um, and the other item in that deficit is about uh, 225,000 for some special projects that the mayor has requested um, and um, I can go into more details later, but I think most of the council already is aware of those, and we can certainly discuss it. But I expect there will be discussion on it tonight. Thank you. Here, um, Tara has a presentation that she would like to deliver, just kind of summarizing. I um, a job. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry at all. Um, so I'd like to introduce Tara Dunford, who is our accountant um, consultant that we talk that, that we have contracted with. Um, to cover a lot of our um, accounting and finance uh, audit. Tara, I apologize. I've been referring to you as Mumford. It's a no. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't want anyone to think she was in the band. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I just want to go through a few highlights of the budget, mainly what's changed from last year, and then touching on the general fund budget. We won't go into depth on all of the funds tonight. Um, so the, the most significant changes in the budget document, we updated the indirect cost plan this year. So we went through the uh, methodology, methodology that was used for allocating costs across funds and departments. And the most significant change was that we had um, two IT positions that reside in the police department that were not being allocated across the city, despite the fact that we serve the entire city. Um, so we incorporated those costs and the related network and web costs um, of IT across departments. This uh, reduced the general fund expenditures about $365,000. Um, we did add the asset replacement plan. This formalizes what has been done informally in the past. So in past budgets, it's been somewhat of a one-off. We desperately need police vehicles, so we come and ask council to approve those in the budget. Uh, that results in the budget spiking up and down year to year. We might have many items that need to be replaced in one year and not so many the next year. This asset replacement plan serves to smooth this out over the budget. 
um, and smooth out the impact on the operating budget. So we've went through line by line, every single vehicle determined how long it's going to last, how much it's going to cost to replace it, applied an inflation factor, and then leveled out what we need to contribute every year to ensure that we have money to replace that asset when it comes due for replacement. Um, that does have a cost to the general fund of $942,000 a year. It's a big number. Um, comparatively, we included $225,000 last year for police vehicles, $350,000 for a deposit on a fire vehicle, and $75,000 for a parks vehicle. So we're not too far off of what was included last year. It's just that we're leveling these out and, and smoothing this out with this budget. Um, another change is we added a separate fund for the opioid settlement dollars, and um, you'll have a new committee that will be determining how to spend those funds. The money is currently sitting in the general fund, and I know it can get a little bit confusing to see how that impacts the budget. These are substantial dollars that are coming in. The city's award is currently over $1.1 million and more coming all the time. So I think it makes sense to track this separately going forward. Um, another change is that we eliminated fund 318, which is the abatement fund, and rolled that into the community development department. You can see in your budget document, I tried to show the total um, impact on community development. The budget is actually going down substantially when you factor in the, the combining of the funds. Um, there are several other funds that I, I think could get rolled up and uh, consolidated in future years, but that is the only change, um, only reduction to funds this year. And then uh, there is a reduction in the total FTE count, which we'll discuss momentarily. Uh, so the FTE schedule, we can go to the next slide. Um, I apologize, the FTE schedule that's in your draft budget doesn't fully reflect all of the changes. We'll get that corrected for next time. But as far as what the numbers reflect, um, the first thing I want to point out is that budget numbers do reflect cost of living adjustments for all positions. So 5% for police, 3.6% for fire. This is per union contracts based on actual CPI. Um, the AFSCME rate is pending. Uh, that's based on October CPI, which should be available here in a few weeks. Uh, the current placeholder is 4% for those increases. Um, and we have historically given the same increase to non-represented employees. There's a 4% uh, increase in there as a placeholder currently. Um, there are numerous position cuts and changes in the budget. None of these cuts result in layoffs. Um, so cutting two police officer positions uh, that are currently vacant. Um, cutting an accountant three, that position is currently filled, but um, there is an open position in public works to move the person to. Um, cutting two uh, vacant maintenance worker provisionals. Reducing the parks temps by half, so going from 20 part-timers to 10. Uh, replacing the finance director position, which has been vacant for quite some time with a lower finance manager position. Um, additions to the budget, replacing one maintenance worker with an assistant city electrician. This will be 100% utility funded, um, no impact to the general fund. Adding a civil engineer, again, 100% utility funded, and adding a custodian, same thing. Uh, no general fund increases based on these changes, only cuts happening um, as a result of freezing existing positions. And next slide, just at a summary level, um, I think it's always helpful to look fund by fund, are we increasing or decreasing fund balance in certain scenarios that make sense and you would expect to see a decrease in fund balance. Um, for example, KBD funds, we accumulate resources for several years and then spend them on, on big projects. Um, so not too concerning to see large decreases there. Um, the general fund does still have a budget deficit, um, a decrease of $1.1 million. So we'll talk about momentarily. Um, the EMS fund is one to point out. Uh, this, the fund balance is projected to decrease over $800,000 in 2025. 
This is, does not have a direct impact on the general fund yet, but it will when that fund balance is drawn down to zero, the general fund will have to pick up the difference and fully subsidize that shortfall. Um, so something for council to keep up in the back of your mind as we move through uh, subsequent budget processes. Uh, next slide, please. The utility construction fund uh, 399 includes $500,000 for ele elevator replacement. Um, that's using real estate excise tax proceeds. And the water fund includes uh, over $4.7 million in capital projects. Looking at the general fund specifically, um, you'll know we still have this $1.1 million shortfall. Comparatively, the shortfall operationally was over $3 million in the 2024 budget. So we're moving significantly in the right direction. Um, 2025 revenues are consistent with 2024 only with the proposed utility tax increase. So if that utility tax increase doesn't go through, we're looking at the shortfall of the 1.1 plus an additional $970,000. So we're essentially back to a $2 million budget deficit without that additional revenue. It's really critical for balancing the city's general fund without having to make substantial cuts, which at this point would be people. There's, there's really not a whole lot to cut other than salaries and benefits. And the proposed expenditure budget is over a million dollars less than 2024. That's a result of position cuts, adjusting the cost allocation, and then additional um, operating cuts identified by directors um, who worked really hard and going line by line through their budgets and cutting everything they could. Um, so talking about the decrease in fund balance of $1.1 million, that includes $225,000 of one-time items, which from an accounting perspective, I feel very comfortable saying that's a good use of fund balance or reserves, if you will. Um, this includes $50,000 for council chamber upgrades, $25,000 for Portland Blue, and $150,000 for a property purchase. Um, this also includes the $942,000 for asset replacement contributions. We haven't formally included that line in the budget before. Um, our proposal is to utilize armory funds to balance the budget, pay for the $225,000 in one-time expenses, and fund $883,000 of the $942,000 asset replacement contribution. Obviously, the long-term goal is that the asset replacement dollars can be included in the operating budget going forward. Um, again, we're, we're really moving in the right direction here, and we were not able to get fully balanced here. Um, on the revenue side, the taxes make up 75% of general fund budget. So property tax, we just talked about, you're very restricted on increasing property taxes. The new construction was about estimated $80,000 this year. That's not going to go super far. Um, utility tax really is the only thing that you can control easily at this time to generate revenue for the city. Um, and again, the Increase in utility taxes are included in these budget numbers in the preliminary budget. So if that does not go through, we'll need to adjust the budget downwards. And um, touching on some key changes on the expenditure side, uh, the legislative line includes $50,000 for council chamber upgrades. The executive increase reflects moving the deputy city clerk and public records position into the executive budget. It was previously living in legal. Um, general government is decreasing, which reflects the inclusion of the IT expenses in cost allocation. Facilities reflects the decrease in homeless related expenses. Um, the increase in community development reflects incorporating fund 318 abatement into the general fund. And uh, this is offset by a decrease in transfers out. 
the true overall reduction to the community development budget is actually two hundred thousand dollars or fifteen percent. So that that budget truly is going down. Uh, the police budget reflects the reduction of two officers and reductions in transfers out reflect cuts to the parks and streets budgets, um, cutting the parks temps and cutting to provisional maintenance workers. And as far as how this impacts reserves, uh, this is a summary of the armory insurance proceeds. So 23.7 million was the original amount received. Currently we have $15.2 million sitting in fund balance, not spent yet. Um, council has previously allocated $7 million to the levy project. Um, in the budget in, for 2025, we're requesting to use $225,000 for the mayor's one-time items and then $882,000 to fund the majority of the asset replacement contribution. Uh, next up, we have second and third reads scheduled for the November meetings. Thank you, Tara. That was really helpful. Appreciate it. Is there any other discussion? Council for support. So there's some comments and a couple questions. So first off, I want to thank uh, staff of all the budget that have come before me since my time on council. This one, it, the layout was fantastic. I really appreciated the descriptions of all the different funds, uh, the deliverables, the goals. Um, it was just very raw and informative, and I appreciate your hard work. Uh, secondly, I want to thank you, uh, Council Member Cedar, uh, for being protective with your time, answering all my questions that I had about the budget. So uh, very appreciated. Um, so one of the things that I got a harp on, I guess, um, fifty thousand dollars for the council chambers. I understand the reasoning for wanting to do that while the construction is being done on the elevator. I completely understand that. But the problem is, I think you know going to the community with utility rate and tax increases and with our budget being the way it is, um, I think the optics are not good um, to be doing stuff in the council chambers right now. I understand wanting to move desks around. I completely support that. This layout, this format is much better for a discussion. I completely support that. But going and doing a bunch of construction in there to the tune of $50,000 right now with everything going on, I, you know, any of them for me. So um, I, I would like to see that removed. Um, yeah, I have one question, and maybe I must have missed it. Um, the property purchase, but what is what property are we purchasing and for what? That's uh, the lot that's downtown. Uh, we currently own one lot. There's a parking lot. We own half of it. Yeah. It's the other half of that parking lot. Is this for the project that you've been talking about? Okay, thank you. And then the other question that I had, um, will there be any um, staff or director, director furloughs plan for the 2025 budget term or for the rest of the year? Yes, they, we are putting out a voluntary furlough um, to staff and directors to see if they would like to um, take furloughs um, in the amount of the COLA increase that's for next year. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Ms. Chapman? All right. Uh, thank you, Glenn. It's uh, Public Safety Chairperson Hodgkin. Hey, so, so I'm going to give you a little bit more information on this than I usually do because I used to escape this quick synopsis, but mm. we're going to have the first reading for Bill 24-12, um, Ordinance Amending AMC 10.20, to provide for inspections and infractions related to commercial and recreational vehicles. So I'd like to just take a few minutes just to read this real quick. Why don't we move first? Um, okay, we can do that. Okay, so uh, it's recommended um, that Public Safety Committee, that the Aberdeen City Council approve the new ordinance and modifications of current ordinances. And second then. First and second, is there any discussion? Oh. Yeah. And I'll just go ahead and just read this. Okay. So um, our, our friends here know. Um, the Washington State Supreme Court recently issued a decision in Potter versus the city of Lacey. 
in which the court affirmed the authority of municipalities to en enact and enforce parking regulations. Um, and this was just um, passed again two weeks ago. So, um, Aberdeen Municipal Code AMC Title 10 regulates the use of parking of vehicles and traffic within the limits of the city of Aberdeen, providing specific regulations for parking in Chapter 10.20 um, AMC. The parking and use of commercial and recreational vehicles can have a large impact on access and use of public roadway and right of way, as well as public safety and environmental impacts at higher levels than standard and compact size vehicles. The city council believes it is in the best interest of the city to amend its parking regulations to address parking of commercial and recreational vehicles within the city as authorized by Potter versus the city, the city of Lacey decision. The city desires to create a new section in chapter 10.20 AMC regarding restrictions on the parking of commercial and recreational vehicles within the city and amending existing codes within that chapter to accommodate new provisions and ensure proper functionality, application and enforcement of the code. The city desires to amend ordinance 6696 AMC 10.20.280 to define a new infraction for violation of commercial and recreational vehicles parking restrictions and it is anticipated that enforcement will begin January of 2025 after a public outreach campaign. So we do have a lot of um, commercial vehicles or recreational vehicles that are parked on the street and it does cause congestion. Um, people are living in them. We are doing you know everything that we can to um, help the city, uh, you know, flow and, and, and do the best that we can. So we hope that we have the city supporting us. I did get a letter about someone's dissatisfaction with it, but other people stand on the other side of this issue. So the people are on both sides of the issue, right? Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. We're going to help um, as much as we possibly can. All right, Jane, other discussion? Council Kristen Siegel. Of all of the complaints I received from citizens in my ward, this is probably at or very near the top of the list of a lot of the vacant RVs around town um, or a lot of the RVs that people are living out of. And so I think it's really prudent that we do what we can to address this issue. Thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, Councilperson Tyler? Uh, I, I was just wondering, so it's not going to start until January? That's what it said. Why are we waiting so long? We have to, oh, I'm sorry, may I Go answer ahead. that? Yeah. Um, we have to give notice, we have to send notice, because this doesn't just impact people who are living in their vehicles, this also impacts residents who have their vehicles parked on the street. They now need to find places to park, alternative places to park their vehicles. Um, so we wanted to give them at least a couple months if this passes, a couple months to just send out and do a, a communications campaign to inform these people because it will impact their budgets as well. Um, we also need to get and, and start to um, interview groups that will also support this program, um, uh, community resource groups that will act as the in, the in the program itself, which is included in the packet. It, it states that we need a community resource group to be that like liaison between the unhoused person and to point them in the direction to to point them in the direction of case management or be their case manager. So that's part of the requirement of the program is that they have to be enrolled in case management. So there's quite a few steps that we have to undergo. Any other discussion? I'm missing one issue that might occur from the, the road of the residential part is how are we going to prevent people from driving them over their lawn in their backyards like breaking water lines and stuff? Should we put that in the notice that we suggest that they don't put them in their backyard or that's private property yeah, we have no control over or maybe we should send a little map of the water we are i mean we're really only worried about the water line on one side of the water meter and that's the street side so okay. and, yeah any other discussion yeah, yeah. okay uh, all in favor aye, aye. opposed passes all right, so we'll move on to public works with Mr. Oh, sorry. Mr. Mayor. Yes. On behalf of public safety, if, I, if you don't mind, uh, I would actually like to put out a couple things from the police and fire department that I think are important. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And before we do that, though, could, could I excuse you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay, from the fire department. I just wanted to share this with your fire safety information. It's relevant and we just had a, a fire today where it's outside. So um, keep anything that can burn at least three feet away from sources of heat. Keep portable generators outside and away from doors and windows. Install and test smoke and carbon monoxide alarms. Have a qualified professional clean your chimney. Store cool pastures in a metal container and keep them at least 10 feet from your home. Plug only one space heater into an electrical outlet at a time. Do not use propane fed heaters and siding. And then just a reminder from the Aberdeen Police Department that they are starting up the Citizens Academy. Uh, the Aberdeen Hope and Follow Mapa Police Department um, are doing the fifth annual West County Citizens Academy starting January 2025. Um, the courses are being offered at no expense to attendees. They will start January 14th. And will be held on Tuesday evening from 6 30 to 8 30 at the Aberdeen Police Department. There will also be a few Saturday class with help for attendees to participate in some hands on law enforcement activities. This course is approximately 12 weeks long. Applications are available at the Aberdeen Hope Room or Hope Mopless Police Department station or available online at www.aberdeenwa.gov. The class is limited to 20 students and applications are due by December 20th. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Casey, for remembering all that. All right, so we're going on to public works with the chairperson line. We'll wrap up with the public hearing. This is the date set for the public hearing on Bill 24-07, an ordinance amending the zoning code of the city of Aberdeen. I move that we open this public hearing. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, public hearing is now open. Anybody want to come up and comment? No? Seeing none, I move that we close the public hearing. Second. First and second, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Public hearing is now closed. Mm -hmm. Next on the list is a request. We're just recommending that the city council authorize the mayor to execute settlement agreement number one. For the North Aberdeen Bridge project, I move that we adopt this report. Second. Is there any discussion? Seeing that, call in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes. Request recommending that City Council authorize the mayor to execute the interlocal agreements with the Port of Grays Harbor, correcting the sewer trunk line issue in the easement on Port Property. I move that we adopt this report. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes. And request recommending that the City Council accept the $5 million reward from the Public Works Board and authorize the Mayor to execute the funding agreement documents. I move that we adopt this report. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes. And we have a second reading of Bill 24-07, an ordinance amending the zoning code of the city of Aberdeen. I move that we accept this second reading. Okay. Is there any discussion? Council Bruce and Theodore. Um, I just have a quick question for Director Scott um, regarding the zoning of the lakeside property to industrial. Is that a, is that a spot zone or is it surrounded by other industrial? It will be, it is surrounded by an industrial. It it's is not, surrounded. it's just um, what what happened is Lakeside got included in the area adjacent to the pavilion in the park. Got it. And it's always been that waterfront cross got zone it. and it's, but it's a simple matter. It's not a spot zone. No. It is surrounded by other industrial. That's all right. I want to know. Thank you. Council person Morrison. Thank you. And just to be clear, there's nothing that we as a council need to do. You will be be bringing that revision to us at the next council meeting. Right. It will be in your zoning map. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yeah. Council person Hodges. Go ahead, Go ahead Oh, sorry. Um, and I also had a follow up question about the um, industrial designation. It's, um, is that still, um, does that still need to comply with the shoreline management? Everything within the shoreline, no matter what zone it's in, has to comply with the SMP and critical areas. 
I still um, am a little bit concerned about the rezoning of the historic neighborhood to, um, you know, just the impact of traffic and parking on the street and the neighbors are, you know, kind of um, expressing concern. We did have our business in the um, Aberdeen a mansion at one time and the neighbors weren't happy they thought that we created too much traffic and at the time we had like six students so um and they would get you know dropped off for a couple of hours three times a week so um i'm a, I'm a little bit concerned about just the streets filling up with cars and um, if places are rezoned to be you know two four you know um units a um, little bit concerned about the place by the dance studio on 6th Street. That's going to be a number of units with no parking. So I've been I've been reassured that they have to have, you know, parking, you know, two units uh, uh, on, you know, off of the street for the first unit and then one for in, any additional units. But um, so I am. And right now that neighborhood is very full of cars. So I can see that increasing. I'm just concerned about that. Any other discussion? Can I add one thing to that? We're, we're not rezoning. It's a change in the zoning code. So what you're doing is you're allowing a difference in some of the permitted uses. So it's a technically not a rezone. You're just changing and amending the zoning code. So parking is always is required now and will always be required. Um, some of the provisions that you're seeing come with uh, some of the one of the newest things we've never had in the city is in order to comply with that, there are design standards. So what comes with those changes are requirements that they fit into the neighborhood and they blend into the neighborhood. And there's articulations and designs and setbacks and garages and stoops and front porches that are required that weren't before. Um, so there's a, a significant change that comes with being allowed to have up to four units, and you still have to comply with the overall lot coverage requirements, landscaping, driveway size, size which has reductions in it from what is existing today. So it, if anything, it'll blend more into a neighborhood than not. I don't believe you will see um, hardly any conversions if any at all in some of the big houses because they're not going to be able to comply with parking. Um, that's just your biggest thing right now. And then also with the changes in the ordinance that you guys also approved tonight, um, we are looking at going into neighborhoods. It's not just with um, particular, particularly RVs, but also eliminating you being able to park your RV, your boat trailer, or trailer, utility trailer, at the permanent spot in on, on the street. You need to provide space on your property or you're gonna need to move it because we've found that they're clogging the streets as well as there's houses that, you know, we, we can't stop somebody from having 10 children, but what if those 10 children have cars? Houses aren't built for 10 cars, that, that's just not how they were designed. So we're also looking at having residential parking passes potentially in certain neighborhoods, and those would be at no cost, but you would be allowed a certain amount of residential parking on your on the street, um, and, you know, in, in and above what is on your property. And then also, you know, if you have people visiting, maybe going as far as actually issuing uh, passes for guests, you know, that come for a long weekend. So there's things we're looking at because we we too realize parking is congested. Aberdeen was built really before the car. So we have a lot of places that were built without garages and it's just something we have to contend with. Um, whether it's a family of 10 or whether it's somebody, you know, uh, renting a room out in their house. We understand that and we're doing the best that we can and, and hopefully the changes that will have come will help alleviate some of that concern. Okay, so um, what, uh, one thing there is, there was, a, he did a beautiful job flipping the, flipping the house. It's a big older home and he turned it into four units. Everybody parks on the street and, and he did a beautiful remodel, but it has that street, it's on second, it's extremely congested with cars. Um, and I am just concerned about these bigger homes being flipped because that's the easiest way to get more housing here. Also, you know, there you get neighborhoods or in area where you get college students, you know, renting a house and you'll have, you know, four or, you know, college students, so they have five college students and a car per each, you know, so that goes on with by where you live, aren't used to. So, um, yeah, that's why the streets get really congested and I am you know, just concerned about that because you, I, I see the cars coming and the cars parked on either side and I just turn and go a different way. So, and that's now, I just see that getting worse possibly. 
Well, hopefully we'll be able to help alleviate some of that. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. It was a good point, though. Very good. Okay, that's right. Uh, Mayor, I'm sorry, I have taken over for Becca, um, who had to leave. Um, I missed a person that might wanted, may have wanted to deliver public comment. Um, I will, would you mind if yeah, I check? Okay. I, I apologize, you may have to reopen the hearing, so I apologize. Um, did you want to, um, I have someone online with the last number 3655. Uh, were you interested in delivering public comment? They put their hand down, so I'm assuming no. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I'm sorry about that. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Is there any comments, any further comments on this? No? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? All right. Passes. That's it for public board. Thank you, Stairs. Uh, special uh, committee items, council president flourishes. All three from the side today. So for the reports, we have a request from personnel recommending that the city council adopt the MOU on grievance procedures with the IAFF Local 315. I move that we adopt this report. Okay. Is there any discussion? Stephen, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes. Next, we have a request from personnel recommending that the city council adopt the pay range change for the accounting technician one position upon AFS CME union approval. I move we adopt this report. Second. Is there any discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Opposed? I, I, I am assuming that when Pass. you say rate change, that that is going up, not down. Okay. Correct. And last on reports, we have a request from personnel recommending that the City Council adopt the Accounting Technician 3 job description and classification also upon AFS CME union approval. Okay. Is there any discussion on this? Uh, Council Person Cedar. Um, City Administrator uh, Clemens, I have a question. Is, are we creating a new Technician 3 or is this or maybe it's um, Director Smith could answer I'm, the question better. I'm happy to answer that question. I'm just curious. Didn't don't weren't we shifting someone away from the accounting three position or back to public works? Or is this? Am I confused about what this is? Yeah, this is the accounting technician. So this is a lower grade position, um, three position. Um, this person does all of the utility billing for the city and does it alone. So this was a to move them into what I felt was more appropriate, um, considering that they do this job by themselves and it's 100% utility funded. So it has no impact to the general fund. Thank you. Question? Um, all in favor? Aye. Um, opposed? Yes. Next we have a resolution declaring a local emergency. Mm -hmm. We adopt this resolution. Is there any discussion? Is that we, this is related to our cyber attack. Yes, mm -hmm. it's related to the cyber attack. Um, yes, the mayor sent a proclamation out um, allowing, but this makes it so that we are officially declare an emergency, which is part of the process. It's going to allow us to utilize resources as needed for this time. Any further discussion? Councilperson Morrison? That has expired in one month, correct? Okay. Yeah, from the date that yeah we declare. Oh, thank yeah. you. Anybody else? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We also have an appointment to the Museum Collections Committee. That will be Council Member Francie. Who knows that we accept this appointment? I second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Congratulations. Yeah. All right, so now we'll the floor back up to public comment. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> public comment, please uh, keep them civil. Start off with your name and your address or ward, please. 
Done? Oh, here we go. Hi, good evening, Tara Merritt, Ford Fork. Um, just wanted to comment on the rezoning of the neighborhood. I've been in touch with Lisa Scott this week. Last this week. week. <laughs> <laughs> and um, a couple of the council members, I've talked to Liz Ellis about it, Sam Cedar, Doug Hodgkin, um, about the rezoning. And forgive me if I'm not using the correct verbiage, but I too just had some concerns about the congestion of the neighborhood, the narrowness of the streets, the parking and vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, We've lived in the neighborhood for 15 years and we've had RVs and vehicles that have been parked on the streets. Tabs are updated or not, um, and we've largely just ignored it. But um, I really, really am impressed tonight to see the progress that you've made with some of the, the federal birds. Great to see things there. Um, people added to the city staff to make progress with the buildings downtown. This is progress. Congratulations. Um, Really hope that we can see more forward momentum at such a rapid pace. So thank you and congratulations. Um, the other thought that I had was just about this rezoning. It's like a 260 page digital document and I skimmed through it. It was like, I will sit with that later. Because <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot to review there, but uh, we've got some good things happening. And I think if we continue on this path, you guys, this college is amazing and there is so much potential here and it's time to tap into it there's people that might say we don't want to see this place grow but we do and we don't want to keep cutting trees down and we won't but there's places to put apartments and have decent places for these college kids to live and the more we keep creating good activities for these kids to participate in the drugs are just going to go away and the more the presence that we have with these youth, they're gonna to gravitate to people who are a good presence in their lives and not be distracted by the drugs or looking to numb their pain. So let's keep it up. Good job. Thank you, Tara. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else? <laughs> All right. Um, anything for the good of the order? That council person's for. Yes. Um, given that we don't have much to discuss next week, um, I would like to make a motion that we cancel the October 30th council meeting and that we reschedule the November 27th council meeting for the 26th. That would be the day before Thanksgiving. I'm just moving it to the Tuesday if council would allow. I'll, I'll second that. Okay. Uh, is there any discussion? Council person, I had a question. Um, do we need or want to consider next week's meeting as a budget workshop for the council? I was going to judge that based on the comments and feedback that we received here today, and it sounds like most of us are at a general consensus with moving okay. forward. All right, thank you. Does anyone up here feel differently? That we should instead have a workshop next week regarding the budget? It's been any more discussions? Uh, on the, so on the day we do it before Thanksgiving, should we start an hour earlier? So that that meeting what is scheduled for the eleventh, but the twenty seventh, which would be the Wednesday. I'm asking that we move it to the twenty sixth, which would be the Tuesday. And what time would we start? The start usual six thirty. Should we go an hour earlier because we're all going to be really busy the next day? <laughs> Can you remember to <laughs> <laughs> For that reason, I'm requesting it stays at 6.30. <laughs> it probably quick, I still want to be here until 10 o'clock on the morning. I'll never do it. Tech Tech is at 6 o'clock in the morning or 4 o'clock in the morning today. Thank you. Any more discussion? Yep. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Supposed? Okay. So could you name those two dates again that we saw? Um, yeah. What was motion the motion was to um cancel the meeting for next week on october 30th and then to move the november 27th meeting to november 26th keeping the same 6 30 start time okay there we go yes. send me a reminder <laughs> hey we have a meeting on no i'm just kidding uh, uh, council personnel
Um, sorry. Uh, October 28th, um, the Department of Commerce is having a meeting to talk about their Energy Ambassador Program. And I would like to attend, and I'd like the support of council that I'm there representing city council so I can report back to everybody. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Um, and then um, I just wanted to mention a concern I have with the earlier darker nights settling in. And there are many pedestrians out there without reflective gear. Um, there are bicyclists and people on scooters zooming around uh, in front of vehicles or not watching where they're going. Um, please use lights or reflective clothing if you're out at night. Um, and just think safety of yourself and of others. And I, and I, I just want to add to that also, uh, if you're driving along and somebody's jaywalking in front of you, you have to slow down for them. You can't, you can't like drive straight towards them. <laughs> and, and Halloween, Halloween is coming up. Be careful. There'll be a lot of kids on the streets. Yeah. Didn't we used to have, didn't we used to have an ordinance that required headlamps when you're on a bicycle? It's, it's a law. It's, it's a law. law. It's a Washington law. Yeah. Oh, everybody follows the law. And police, they're they're overburdened, you know. So it's trying to pull everybody over that is on a bike ride on can get you difficult for them. But they do stop a lot of people and talk to them about it. Yeah. Can't even get all speeders for not yeah. I've just seen a lot of it lately. Like, so more than usual. Yeah. Like people over so on the sidewalks so though it doesn't count. And like Liz said, they've all been wearing dark clothes too. All right. I move uh, that we adjourn our meeting tonight. Second All in favor? Aye. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Appreciate your time. Thank you for you. Thank you for you. Oh, yeah. You're back up. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>